Stars 800 series AM5 boards and Mini ITX goes. This board is it. It's a very comprehensive Mini ITX board though. And here's what I think you'll want to know. Welcome to Machines and More. So recently we covered the Ryzen 9000 launch. Along with that announcement was boards with the new 800 series chipsets. First up to launch are the X870E and the X870 boards. Uh, this is going to be your higher end chipset option. And as of right now, MSI Gigabyte, ASRock, they haven't launched a mini ITX option in the 800 series. If you want the latest and greatest AM5 board, let's talk about your single choice today, the ASUS ROG Strix X870i ITX. I'll talk through the features, I'll give you some recommendations, and we'll evaluate what kind of build or builder this board might make sense for. Before we begin, big thanks to ASUS for providing our test board today. As with all of our reviews here on the channel, they're not paid for or sponsored by the manufacturers, and you can always expect independent and objective feedback. And please go ahead and make sure you are subscribed if you enjoy this type of content. So the window for press reviews opened up last week, but after trying out the board, I did want to spend a little bit more time getting to explore the features out and really thoroughly test it. The board does currently have retail availability and looks like it is going for roughly $450 US. So it's not a budget board by any means. Uh, this is an enthusiast level board. It's a little more expensive than its predecessor, the X670EI's launch price, uh, but it's mostly in line and we'll discuss that value proposition shortly. First off, quick overview. This board features the X870 chipset, which is the second highest level in the 800 series boards. The, this one on my left, this is the X670E ITX, which I used as my daily gaming driver for quite a while. And this one actually had the highest designation in the 600 series. X870 versus 870E or 670E actually has eight fewer chipset PCIe lanes, and that's six versus 12 10G USB ports. Realistically, for example, the X670EI only had five 10G USB-A ports at the back, plus one for the front C header. And the X870 has a similar setup. It has five rear plus one front C, except now the fifth port at the back right here is now C form factor. And that is one that is meant to connect to the Hive device. And we'll get to that Hive device shortly. The front panel A connector is five gigabits per second. And that's similar to the X670EI. One thing that is different in the A70E and A70 chipsets is that USB 4 is the standard spec, whereas in 600 series it was optional. This Strix board has two 40 gigabits per second C ports. The 670EI already had those two 40 gigabits per second ports anyway. Both ports do have Gen 5 expansion slots and two M.2s. One is Gen 5, one is Gen 4. Long story short, the USB setup between these two boards, it's extremely similar. The new board, the 870i, like the X670EI before it relies on this external device for audio. This one's called the Hive. There's no internal audio built into either of these boards. And the A70i uses an add-on or riser card that's called the FPS2 for the full suite of front panel connectors. You got two USB 2.0 internal headers, two SATA ports, and all of your front panel connections on here. So that there was a quick overview of the 870i, and I'm gonna go ahead and divide the recommendations into the following categories. Nice, so-so, and not so nice. And I hope that will show you where the relative strengths and weaknesses of this board are. So there's a lot to like about this board. This is a high-end board, and they've updated the graphics on the board so that it's actually very intriguing visually. All right, uh, not too many mini ITX builds will have you seeing the board, but for example, if you were doing an Air 200P build, you might be able to catch a glimpse of the graphics a little bit on the M.2 heatsink or the uh, rear IO area. Even though you may not be able to see the board in your build, I do like that they emphasize the aesthetics here because this is an enthusiast option and it should have a high-end look to go along with it. And this definitely has that going for it. What may be more relevant is that it is beefy and heavy. So you've got a 10 layer PCB 
and they further reinforce the board with an expanded back shield section which will help with board cooling and also protection so here you've just got this section just the 670 ei this is a little bit more comprehensive here. The M.2 heatsink section is tall, and this stack here is for two drives. Uh, the top one is gonna be your Gen 4 drive, and the bottom is your Gen 5. But they've kept this fairly narrow and just low enough that a tower cooler like the Nocto U12A that I ran with can work. You have an integrated IO shield at the back here. And overall, the board does, it does absolutely feel heavy and very well built. When I reviewed the X670E board, I noted a few things and I'm quite happy they improved on that with the 870i. First off, you got a clear CMOS button now. There's a button on the rear. The absolute must for an enthusiast board where folks are going to be tweaking, doing RAM OC. And they also put the BIOS flashback and the port that's uh, on, on the back of the board also. Did try it out, works perfectly fine. The board does not have a full debug LED, but there is at least a yellow LED on the board that corresponds to the DRAM light on the Hive device. It is helpful if you happen to not have the Hive plugged in, unless you, at least you know that the, you know, the board is doing RAM training or something like that. The layout, it's another plus of this board. This is not easy for board design, especially for mini ITX, but ASUS continues to place all three fan headers at the top and two ARGB connectors at the top and that makes building and cable management a bit more simple. The manual touch points on the board have been further refined as well. The Q latch, it's a new design there. You don't have to turn it anymore. You just kind of push it down and then you just slot your drive in. I really like that improvement there. The expansion slot latch that they're doing on this one uh, this is called the Q release slims. If you're removing the card, you don't need to manually toggle the latch anymore. You just need to tilt the card towards the latch and then the card, really the slot will release the card on its own. And if you've ever had to press down this button in a mini ITX build, you know just what a headache this can be for doing that swap. You also got Wi-Fi 7 on this board, something you may not uh, be able to utilize fully just yet without a compatible router. But something you will notice is that the latest Q antenna here, it no longer threads in. And this just is a push fit. And that also helps with the connection quality versus a threaded connection that could sometimes work loose. The X870i has an overkill power delivery setup. I got 12 stages for the CPU, two for the SOC. These are 110 amp smart power stages. This is absolutely enough power delivery to easily run any Ryzen 9000 or 7000 CPU out there. Performance with the X870i is good. And all the tests I ran with the 9900X on a 240 AO, it was usually a tiny bit better at stock than its predecessor for single core and uh, game boost clocks. These were perfectly fine here. And uh, even the multi-core performance tested with Blender was surprisingly better. The stronger CCD clocked in 55 megahertz higher here. And these were on the same adhesive version in case you're uh, curious about that. As some of you might know, they've been changing the TDP options for the 9600X and 9700X. So most of you won't be buying this board for use with either of those chips, but AMD is still adjusting the microcode. So I do anticipate things to get even better uh, over time. And it's still fairly early in the Ryzen 9000 cycle still. No inductor or coil whine or unpleasant noise noted with this board. This board does have two mini fans. Uh, the top one is going to be more for your power delivery components because of its position. And the bottom one is going to be more for the chipset and M.2 cooling. For either of these, you cannot control the fan curve. You can see the speed in most hardware monitors, but it's not something they give you control over. But thankfully, other than the full speed spin up at boot up, you typically do not hear the fans. To test the chipset and VRM temps, I ran this with the U12A to get a scenario where the air wasn't directly blowing on the motherboard like you might have with a side mounted AIO. In this case, the CPU is uh, fully loaded for 30 minutes. Uh, and even in this scenario where you don't have air directly being blown onto the motherboard, the chipset and VRM temps here are just fine. Nothing to worry about here. So the board cooling is in fact doing its job quite well. 
Lastly, I mentioned the specs earlier, the high speed USB connectivity is a plus. It's a really nice feature for this ITX board. Certainly it's what you absolutely have to have for a high end option. You also have three 2.0 ports. It would have been nice to have 10 GE, of course, or even 5 GE versus a 2.5 GE that's spec'd here, but you wanna pay for it, right? And there's also cooling considerations that come along with that. And you still do have a temp probe sensor, which is convenient for any custom loop build. The 10 g USB-C port is designated for connection to the Hive device. So if you connect the Hive device, you'll lose this port, but you do get the bandwidth back on the Hive itself, which has both an A and a C port. So overall, for the IO, different users will have different items on their wish list, but um, this board, I think, overall is still excellent in terms of ITX. So Hive brings us to the first so-so. If you don't have an external DAC, this is actually quite good. I have used the Hive with a wide range of headphones and this particular one I've auditioned with a set of Sennheiser open backs. The sound is full and the gain is good. Neutral sound, uh, the ESS Sabre 9260Q DAC sounds comparable to external DACs in that $100 to $150 price range. The volume knob is handy. You can set some custom functions with the flex key. Got a power button here. So this is not necessarily a bad device, but where it might cause some consternation is that it's yet another cable to an external device. It is magnetic, so that helps with placement, but users will have to consider where to put it. And I understand why they've removed the onboard audio from both of these boards, because there's simply no room given the other features on the board that they wanted to accomplish. But if you don't have a hive, you have no sound unless you're getting sound through your monitor or some other USB audio device. Right? Your full set of debug LEDs are gonna be on this device, so most users are gonna feel compelled to have this connected, right? So you might think, uh, you know, what's the value added of this if I already have an external DAC solution, right? Um, but you are paying for this as a part of the cost of the board, and there's no getting around that. The BIOS is refreshed. It outputs display in 1080 now, which it looks super nice, very crisp. Uh, if you spend a lot of time in BIOS, then that's nice. ASUS's AIOC capability, which isn't new or unique to this board, it's a topic for its own video. It is quite comprehensive, what you can do there. If you just tell it to go without setting any restrictions, it'll actually push quite hard. In fact, it was running the 9900X at more than 205 watts, peaking at 215 with my U12A. And one nice thing it does, it tracks the CPU's data over time. You might find that interesting from a historical standpoint. And as it's gathering more and more data, it will be able to better tune your CPU. It can tune PBO on a per core level. Lots of folks will just set an all core offset typically and then leave it, which is totally fine. Uh, but even if you're doing your own tuning, that functionality can get you a quick starting point. So even for an enthusiast, I think there is some value there. Overall though, for the new BIOS, you might find it great. Um, they clearly spent a lot of effort on it, uh, but you may just set Expo and never bother with it again. So that's why this is a so-so, you know, maybe it's a useful feature for you. Okay, not so nice. Like with the X670EI, you've still got the FPS2 card. And again, I understand why they choose to do this this way. And my concern with this add-on card isn't necessarily the existence of the card itself, but rather the functions that have been delegated to it. So two SATA ports, fine. Um, even the two USB 2.0 ports, fine. But if you don't use this riser card, you only have a power button connector on the board, and that may be all you need for your SFF build. But I really wish that the full suite of front panel connectors was on the board itself, and perhaps, you know, one of the RGB ports could have been moved onto the add-on card and preserved the full front panel connectors, right? It's not particularly egregious, but it can be in the right, or I guess the wrong scenario. So for example, in NR200, it was right up against the cable management of the power supply cage, makes it really tight there. Or say you're thinking to build in the Ghost R1 and you wanna run something like the new Noctua D15G2, where the second fan overhangs the RAM. This and the front panel connections that stick straight up, uh, these are those are actually gonna push the fan higher 
to where the clearance requirement would be 10 millimeters higher, so about uh, 175 millimeters per noctua. So yeah, this FPS2 card could actually be a clearance issue in a few scenarios. So let's talk value. Overall, this is a very good board, and it is the only 800 series ITX choice now. It does have a few quirks as to discuss. If you're considering this, ask yourself, can I take advantage of all those features? Because you're paying for all those features if you buy this board. At $449, it's $50 less than the Strix X870E-E, which is going to be one of your highest in ATX options. But there you have way more stuff going on. And this board, it simply feels quite constrained by the mini ATX form factor versus all that it is trying to do. So you do have to decide, can I utilize the high-speed ports? Can I utilize the power delivery? hive uh do i want to build quality yeah there's a lot of features that you're gonna have to think through right and for many of you the answer will be no and that's totally fine right because that is how it is with a lot of high-end products typically speaking to maximize your budget you don't want to spend more on the board than the cpu you're running now that's not some kind of magic formula but you don't want to cheap out You'd also want to get too nice of a board if you're just running a more simple CPU, but typically a perfectly capable board should run you a little bit less than the CPU you're planning to use. At $449 for this board, the only Ryzen 9000 CPU right now that isn't cheaper than this board is the 9950X. The 9900X, it's close in price, but it is actually cheaper than this board, so I would really only consider this board for an enthusiast level Ryzen 9 build where you absolutely must have the best. And keep in mind that is best that comes with some fine print. So until we see B850 likely next year, the other cheaper Strix board, which is the B650E ITX, that would still be my go-to for mid to high-end build at this point. It's got the Gen 5 slot, it's got the Gen 5 M.2, but that keeps onboard audio. And even though the power delivery, it's not as overkill, as this board, it's still perfectly adequate for any AM5 CPU now. And I fully expect that to be the case with the B850 and I look forward to what will be the more mainstream option in a B850 ITX board from ASUS. If you're cross shopping this guy, the X670EI, where there's still some remaining inventory, if the price difference is within $50, I would absolutely choose the new one, the 870-i. The small improvements like the clear CMOS button and the improved manual touch points, I think these are absolutely worth it here. Um, so yeah, bottom line for me on this board, ASUS put a ton of high-end features and hardware onto this board. Tremendous build quality, tremendous effort into this board and the software, a lot of software side functionality as well. It will deliver the highest end performance and stability for any AM5 CPU in the mini ITX form factor. And while most of you aren't going to need those features, I'm kind of still glad it exists, right? Because I'm glad ASUS didn't say, hey, nobody else is doing high end ITX. So let's just not bother. Let's just not make a board. Uh, you know, there will be no 800 series ITX boards if that were the case, right? And I'm glad they still tried to deliver as much as they could for enthusiasts within the 17 by 17 form factor. So I hope you found this review helpful. So please give a like, make sure you are subscribed, links for the board and build down below. Thanks for watching.